Right, I, I'll fine. start sharing again. Yeah. Session's Did being you recorded. want to do this? Mm. Session is being recorded. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name's Jane Secker. And I'm Chris Morrison. We are the co-chairs of the Association for Learning Technologies Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. Um, I and thought this you forgot is... who you were for a minute. You did? Okay. I, right, no, I know who I am. Yes, definitely know who I am today. Um, and it is the 65th webinar of copyright and online learning at a time milestone, of uncertainty. Another milestone. Another milestone. There we go. Um, mm. So we've got a lot to cover today. So uh, we've got some copyright news, but the, the, the stars of the show are uh, colleagues from the Open Education Network who are going to talk about their work uh, and what they've been doing. Um, and we're really looking forward to them. So let's move on quickly in order to take up the time. So since we last met, we've been doing some stuff, haven't we? Where, where, where were you? Yes. Um, I went to Krakow actually um, last month. I went to the European Conference of Information Literacy, my favourite European conference about information literacy. Um, and yeah, no, it was really, it was really nice. It was the first time going to the conference since before COVID. Um, it was in yeah, Pol Poland in Krakow, which was beautiful. And this was me catching up with some um, European friends at a sort of networking event they had, and it was really great. I did a couple of presentations. Um, yeah, so and I've also written a blog post about it um, that is also celebrating the fact that next year. Um, information literacy is going to be 50 years old. So it's 50 years since the term was coined by Paul Zukowski. So if you want to read more about that and you're an information literacy nerd, then I, I've written about it. But I've also written a little bit about the conference I went to. Yeah, Chris. great. And I, I put a link in, in the chat to that. Um, this picture on the right is uh, an event I went to here at the Bodleian Libraries. This was a few weeks back. Um, this is printer Gerhard Steidel, who's talking about offset printing. Um, uh, and uh, his work as a, as a sort of master printer. Um, and of course, there was a Beatles analogy, um, but I couldn't resist but taking a photo of because of, as everyone knows, I'm a huge Beatles fan. Um, and uh, there's been a lot about the Beatles, as everyone knows. So uh, mm. we won't say any more about that because um, maybe another time, uh, yeah. but it was nice to see um, him using that analogy. Uh, this is to let everybody know that we do have an archive of the webinars, uh, the recordings on the YouTube channel, if you want to go back to previous episodes. So it's time for. Quite a few it's items copyright today. News. It's copyright news, yeah. Yeah, so first item up is um, that uh, Matt Voigt, who's the IFLA uh, copyright and licensing specialist, he's um, sending out a weekly newsletter, which um, was being sent by email. Um, he's moved it on to Substack. I think you still get an email, do you, as well, if you subscribe yes, yep. by sub he's Substack? One just came through this morning, yeah. Yeah, so um, just if you're interested in the world of international um, copyright and how it's affecting libraries um, do have a look at his news because it's it's great and Matt's going to be joining us as well um, for our, our last webinar of the um, the year isn't he so yes absolutely um, so okay. that's good the next one is the, it looks like I am doesn't it yeah um, <laughs> uh, hot off the press UKRI um, have just released this uh, guidance on managing third party content in um, research publications with a focus on open access monographs written by uh, friends of this parish. We have Emily Hudson, Tanya Applin and Claire Painter to thank for that. So as you might expect from um, those uh, illustrious names, it's extremely um, thorough um, and helpful and useful guidance for anybody who is advising people on on copyright in their research publications um, and we hope to have them on a webinar in the coming in the months. New year. yeah so watch this space watch this space yeah fantastic 
Okay, next up, um, we've got an event um, that is um, happening based on some work that many of you will be familiar with. Chris and I worked with Bart Maletti to develop a code of fair practice um, for film education. And um, if you are in the vicinity of either Bournemouth or Glasgow, there are two in-person events going on. Um, Chris is putting the links into um, how you how you sign up to those. Um, they are not, um, they are, I believe that there will be notes, there'll be a kind of transcript from each event, but they're not being recorded or live streamed. Um, so if you happen to be near or around Bournemouth, you can go along to the event that's happening on the 21st of November. Um, and I think the, the lecture from Richard Misek, um, who is talking about his use of, uh, I think it's mainly Getty, um, isn't it, for, and how he's used it to make a film, Getty Images, um, mm -hmm. that will be on the 20th of November in Glasgow. So two exciting events, but you will need to get there in person. And Chris is going to Bournemouth. I am. I'm going to be on. I'm going to be a part of the panel. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll call for papers. I'll do this one if yes. you want. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. So coming up really soon, um, this weekend, the Open Education Resources Conference that's hosted by the Association for Learning Technology. It's going to be out in Cork next spring. Um, it's always a great conference, and there's always a small number of um, copyright people that come along to it. We think copyright is vastly important in the world of ed open education and um so yeah it'd be good to see more people going along maybe see about speaking at this event as well we've we've both spoken at it and it's yeah it's a great conference it is um the next one there is a survey out from knowledge rights 21 um on copyright and research so people who are responsible for copyright and research related policies within their institutions being encouraged to complete this survey um, so there's the link to that for anybody um, who thinks that they fit that bill. Next one. We wanted Yay. to highlight this one. I think Tim, you're on the call. So, yeah, I think, Tim, we just wanted to say we love copyright heights. It's absolutely fantastic. Who needs Netflix when you can play copyright heights on a Friday night? That's what I was doing last Friday. Um, I've been thinking no, about the avocado macchiato um, all week, actually, and how revolting it sounds. So for for anyone, anyone that hasn't seen this link, hasn't checked it out, this is Tim Riley at Aberdeen, who's created this um, game, online game for students to understand copyright, the basics of them. And it, yeah, it's obviously fits the bill for, for, for us, it's the kind of thing we're into. Um, great piece of work. Um, it is. And, so, uh, and I think yeah, we, so, we should get him on to tell us a bit more about maybe in the spring how he made the game yeah. and, you know, share some tips because it is it's really good. It's really. And it was. It, really yeah, nice. it was. And good to have he Ice says, Pops yeah, part yeah. of the mix of that. Ice Pops was um, where you came and showed people and got some input into that. So really great. Um, and there's a, 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 we need to move on. One final piece of news. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Yes. So um, we have um, now got a report out that's an evaluation of this webinar series. Um, we're very grateful to Sarah Hammond, who works with us behind the scenes um, on copyright literacy related things. Um, but she um, sent out a survey to follow up from a survey we did during the pandemic. And this is all informing um, how we put together these webinars. So if you did complete the survey, thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to have a look at the kinds of things people have said about our webinars, um, things they'd like to see more of, things they'd like us to do less of, um, then, you know, have a read of the report and we'll probably spend longer in the new year maybe having a look at that. But we are listening to your feedback and we're very grateful for the nice things that people say about us. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so, so without further ado, <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm really delighted to introduce our speakers today. Um, we have a fantastic lineup, um, but headed up by David Beals from uh, Brunel University, where you're director of uh, the library there. David, you came along to Ice Pops um, 
uh, in the summer up in Glasgow. You haven't run away from the community. You've obviously enjoyed yourself. You agreed to give this webinar, um, I think even before you came to Ice Pops. And we're really grateful to your, your colleagues, um, Karen, who um, is from the um, Open Education Network and is um, up an unearthly hour of the morning to um, to join us from the US. So we're very grateful to Karen. Um, we've also got Helen Moore from the University of Sheffield, who is in the tech same time zone, um, and uh, Joe McVie and Sam Pike from Brunel University as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to David, I think, who's going to get us kicked off with what this Open Education Network is all about. Um, so if we just get your slides up, David. David, can you you can hear us? Yeah. Yes, I can. Thanks, Jane. And we can hear you. Hooray. So thank you so much for joining us. Lovely. Uh, thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. My name's um, David Beals. I'm the um, university librarian at Brunel. And I'll let all my colleagues and friends introduce um, themselves as they give their presentations. Um, but I'll just start by kind of giving an overview of what we're going to be doing in the session. Um, and we'll start with um, an introduction to the Open Education Network by um, Karen Lawrenson. I used to work with Karen in California far too many years ago um, to count, but she has, um, she'll be um, recounting her experience in the Open Education Network and seeing it grow from a relatively small collaboration of libraries to the mature community that it is now. Um, and then we'll hear from Helen Moore. So Helen Moore, the University of Sheffield, we've been collaborating with her for the past few months at Brunel. And we've been really impressed with what they do at Sheffield, at the University of Sheffield um, in open education resources. And particularly, I think we've learned a lot from Helen about her experience in supporting academics who are interested in writing or editing their own open access textbooks. And then lastly, um, we'll be hearing from my colleagues at Brunel. And we have, over the past few months, we've been developing a pilot workshop based, based on the Open Education Network model adapted to the UK. And we can give you our initial feedback that we're hearing from academics about that. Um, at the end of the session, I will come back and I'll talk a little bit about um, the strat strategic implications that we're finding at Brunel, because we're, we're getting a lot of interest in what we're doing. So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, but before I hand over to Karen, um, I just one of the things that I would want to draw out is probably why we are really keen to do this now. So at the University of Sheffield and at Brunel, we are the first two universities in the UK to have joined the Open Education Network. Um, but it's not on my part for one to trying. So when I came back from the US, which was about nine years ago, um, I was working uh, I was the head of the Institute of Cancer Research Library. So I didn't have any exposure to students, um, but I was part of the M25 group and I was um, hosting a session there with other library directors. And I was really keen for somebody then to take on the work of the Open Education Network in the UK. But I was met with, shall we say, polite scepticism. And in retrospect, I think I can understand why. I think um, at that time, when we were talking about open education resources, there wasn't a huge amount of engagement from academics. But I think what's happened in the intervening years makes this a really good time for us to, to be involved in this. So um, where we used to be able to say, for instance, with our collection development policies that we would cope. I don't think we ever really felt comfortable um, with the number of textbooks we would provide to students. And I think we probably had, to my mind, we had an ideal student in mind. And if they met us in the library where we are, then we would um, commit to providing them with the textbooks that they needed. But I think we all realized that that doesn't necessarily help at-risk students and those non-traditional students who aren't able to meet us where we are and I think we have probably underserved them. But at the same time, we were we could say that we coped. What I think has happened in the last few years, particularly with academic publishers and their premium pricing models, is become really clear that we're not going to be able to cope as those models carry on the traje trajectory that, that we they are. And I would say we're probably heading towards a US model. So when I was um, when I joined Cal Poly, um, California Polytechnic State University. I was kind of shocked that in the US, libraries routinely do not provide textbooks for their students. It was something that I just took for granted, um, but it doesn't happen in the US. And that's the direction everyone can see that that's the direction we're heading in now. And that's why, as you hear from Karen and you hear from um, Helen and my colleagues at Brunel, um, one of the things I'd like you to carry with you through those presentations is that the conversations that we're having now in the UK, um, we're getting a really positive reception and we're 
Previously, it was really hard to be heard. Now we seem to be pushing on open doors. So as you listen to um, everybody talking about their experience, I would like you to bear that in mind because I think this is a really good time to be joining the Open Education Network. So now I'll hand over to Karen and she can talk about um, her experience over the last, I, I don't know how many years it is, Karen. <laughs> Soon you will find out. Uh, thanks, David. And hello, everyone from California, where it's a little after 3 a.m. And I am truly delighted to be here with all of you despite the early morning hour. And I'm very interested in hearing from my UK colleagues about how things are going. So nice to meet you. My name is Karen Lauritsen. My background is in education and communications. I began my role at the Open Education Network back in 2016 when it was called the Open Textbook Network. And my responsibilities include maintaining the Open Textbook Library, developing publishing strategy, as well as external communications. And as has been mentioned, I live in California, but I work for the University of Minnesota. That's about a few hours away by plane. And uh, just so you know, when I'm not at work, I might be watching Gardner's World. So uh, when we talked about this presentation, David asked me to give a brief jog down memory lane. And so that's what we're going to do for the next couple minutes. So briefly, what is the Open Education Network? Well, the OEN is simply a community of people working together at higher education institutions, as well as at consortia and systems who support open educational practices. Thus the name change. We really wanted to encompass how uh, our support um, is in a variety of, of open educational practices and spaces. Together through community, professional development and infrastructure, we're making education more affordable and equitable for students. Our community is primarily in North America, including Canada. We also have an Australian member and now two institutions in the UK. And we were also really uh, excited recently to welcome a consortium with international members. So we're really working together on how to support a more global network and translate some of these programs into different contexts. So let's begin our brief jog right on by the donut shop. Uh, the Open Textbook Library was first to launch in 2012. You can see here how we've grown since then. Many more visitors in a day, many more book records, which of course reflects all of the creation and publishing that's happening around the world for OER, and also many more faculty book reviews. And I'll talk a bit more about how we get those book reviews and how that number has grown in just a moment. Now the Open Textbook Network launched a couple years later in 2014, and I came on board a couple years after that. And at the time that I started my role, there were 31 academic libraries, as well as seven library consortia. Those consortia represented multiple campuses. And so altogether, we had around 250 campuses represented in the Open Textbook Network. Now we have more than 1600 campuses in the network. And as you can see, that's quite a bit of growth in a short amount of time, and it's been really exciting. How did this happen? You may wonder, how can we explain this growth? Well, the short answer is truly through people power. Our community who are uh, like you, mostly librarians, but also administrators, instructional designers, and other roles, they've really worked together uh, globally, as well as worked hard on their campuses locally to accomplish a lot. And it's because of them that the library has grown in terms of its collection and use. And it's because of them that so many faculty are adopting and creating open textbooks, often sometimes now, uh, including with students. Now, one reason why the community was able to gain traction was because they were not starting from scratch we shared with them um, basically a strategy a methodology. And um, we created and offered an adoption workshop that they could adapt and implement locally. So briefly, this uh, workshop strategy involves outlining the pertinent issues in higher education, which you are all too familiar with. Uh, that includes the need for greater equity and inclusion among students. We then introduce OER as a strategy for addressing some of these inequities. And then finally, at the end of the workshop, there's a call to action. We invite faculty, now that we've introduced OER, to review a textbook that's in the open textbook library. And this really gives people an opportunity to see if there's an open resource that might work for them. 
And it's really important to note that of those faculty who review an open textbook, almost half of them will go on to adopt one. What sometimes comes from the workshop are questions about faculty, how faculty can create their own open textbook. I'm sure you can imagine people say, this is great, we love the library, but there's nothing here for me. So they ask how they can um, create one and we have programs to support that. In the last few years, they've also been uh, asking about open pedagogy in their classes. And so really the Open Education Network has grown to develop strategies and programs that can support those needs as well. Now, before I talk about community and support and resources, I'll say that as uh, probably most of you or all of you know, there's facilitating workshop and then there's facilitating a workshop. And it really takes some finesse and strategy to host a workshop that's engaging, that motivates people to take action, especially in, in this time when we're operating in an era of compressed time and lagging energy. And that's really where the community support and resources come in so that people don't feel like they're alone in doing this work. And on this slide, you can see a brief glimpse of what community support and re resources look like. Uh, we provide a place for people to connect and ask questions, which happens both in our Google group listserv and at regular events. We offer faculty development, engagement strategies, as well as a range of materials that we've developed in the community that support recommended practices and training. We also offer infrastructure. For example, we offer a data dashboard that helps people manage the workshop things like scheduling, inviting, collecting data about what happens at the workshop. There's also, of course, the open textbook library. And in publishing, we're exploring and informing the development of a variety of publishing platforms. So uh, there's, your, uh, there's your glimpse at some of what the OEN uh, provides. And now, why does this matter? Well, I didn't uh, take you on a brief jog down memory lane at this early hour. Um, to leave you feeling um, kind of wondering how you might be able to do something like this on your campus. Um, I simply want to leave you with the feeling that despite the lonely joggers that I've featured as a metaphorical image in my slides, if you do decide to pursue this work, you don't have to do it alone. There's a proven methodology, there are people who want to help you, and as we've seen over the last several years, we really can accomplish a lot working together. So thank you. Uh, after all that jogging, it's time for a healthy snack. And so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Helen Moore at the University of Sheffield. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. That's a, a really great introduction to the network. Um, so I'm Helen Moore. I'm a faculty librarian at the University of Sheffield. Um, the University of Sheffield joined the OEN in January of this year. And for a long while before that, we benefited from the experience and expertise of its members via webinars and mailing lists. So we've been able to make good progress in several areas as a result of that. And over the next few minutes, I'm just going to describe some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to um, outline the three main areas that we've been able to make progress in. So the first is around developing supportive guidance and infrastructure, getting institutional support, not only through the approval of a, an institutional policy, but through the establishment of an OER working group. And then thirdly, around the creation and publication of OER, I'll wrap up with some of our current challenges and I'm hoping that after all of the presentations, there'll be time for some discussion. So we'll move on quite quickly. So we've spoken extensively to academic colleagues um, and those who support teaching across our institution, just find out what their reaction is to open educational resources. And we knew as we started talking to people that they would want some supporting information because you, you just know that the next question is, is where can I find out more? Uh, what resources are available? Um, so the initial steps we took were to set up an OER web page, and it was just a really simple web page. And we created an OER email address as well. 
Um, the next bit of work was quite a substantial piece of work, work where we worked with our White Rose colleagues at Leeds and York on a project. And that culminated in the production of um, an OER toolkit. And we've got the link at the end of the presentation that you can see. And I'll also share a link in the chat to an article we published recently about our experience of working together in creating the OER toolkit. We took out a um, subscription to Pressbooks quite early on, and that's an authoring tool that's widely used in North America and Australia. And then we joined the Open Education Network, not only because of the benefits that it brings in terms of the expertise and the resources, but also because we wanted to demonstrate our commitment to open initiatives. So secondly, as well as talking to colleagues on the ground, simultaneously, we were having discussions with senior university leadership as well. And this led to the development of an OER policy, which was approved by the University Senate in December last year. Um, the inclusion of OER as criteria for demonstrating effective teaching in our academic career pathways. And that's been really, really valuable, just having something like that to point to when we're talking to our academic colleagues. And then thirdly, establishing the university-wide OER working group. So this is an academic-led working group. It's chaired by um, a faculty director of education, um, which has been really valuable. And I've just listed some of the areas that we're taking forward over this initial period of time. It's, it's got a limited lifespan, this working group. So we envisage it will just last for two years and then hopefully it will evolve into something else, maybe a, a community of practice, something like that. But in this initial two year um, period, this is what we're focusing on. So there's currently an institutional survey on the awareness and use of OER and that runs until the 24th of November. We're evaluating um, some of the tools and platforms available to support OER. So in addition to Pressbooks, which we've already evaluated, we're looking at things like Manifold, which the OEN is also piloting, and um, Quarto and other tools as well. And then you might have come across the, I think it's the Council of Australian University Libraries, They've developed a libguide called the OER Publishing Workflow, which is a fantastic resource. And again, there's a link to this at the end of uh, my slides. And we're looking at changing that so that it's suitable for a UK market. And we'll, we'll share that work when, when that's been done. We're also hoping to develop some case studies from examples of people across the institution who've used and created OER. And following on from what Karen said, we're developing workshops for people who've expressed an interest in exploring OER using some of the resources offered by the OEN. And then the third area that we've been able to take forward um, is academic colleagues wanting to share their teaching materials and publish OER. And we're maintaining a pipeline of individuals and groups. And we've currently got about five or six people at any one time at various stages of this creation process. And we support them in a number of different ways. So we have an initial discussion with people and we give them an overview of options, including open book publishing by repress like White Rose University Press and an explanation of OER, including Creative Commons licenses. We talk about timescales, student involvement, the choice of platform, the importance of accessibility um, issues, export options, being able to get usage statistics, those sorts of things which might influence their choice of platform. We are also able to offer some small pots of money. Um, so we support them in terms of helping 
them to draft a proposal to bid for, for money. And this proposal goes to the library's senior leadership team for approval. Last year, we awarded two small grants and this year we anticipate we'll receive maybe three or four bids for funding. We also support them by offering press books. Um, so we, we expect our authors to take responsibility for the content. We don't really get involved on the content side of things, but we take responsibility for the, for the metadata. If anyone's in receipt of library funding, then we ask them to meet with us on a regular basis. So it's usually monthly, and that's to help them keep the project on track, discuss, discuss any issues as they crop up, so it might be around third party copyright. And we also offer support for those who've not yet applied for funding. The library helps them in terms of discovery and preservation issues. So we work with colleagues in the metadata team and scholarly communications team to ensure that our books are indexed in our discovery system. And we work with our digital preservation team to get advice about longer term preservation. And then finally, we offer some support to our authors to promote books once they've published. Generally, we help them to develop some kind of promotion strategy. That sounds really grand, but it's, it's, it's not that grand. And we announce the book's publication on our web pages and social media channels. So what are our current channels? We have many. <laughs> I think one of the things is is really around increasing awareness um, of OER and encouraging academics to explore the wealth of OER that's already available and discoverable, discoverable via the Open Textbook Library. Um, at Sheffield, our academics are currently more interested in publishing than reusing existing material, but we hope this will change over time as be people become more familiar with OER. Um, with regards to branding and sharing material, the OER Working Group has been a really useful forum for discussing topics that are relevant across the institution. And one of the areas currently under discussion is developing guidelines around how we brand Sheffield OER. And an another matter that academics have raised um, is reaching a decision about what material can and should be shared beyond Sheffield. So these are all things that as an institution will address. And then we're trying to gather an institutional picture of who's using and creating the OER. We've got some data from the survey that we did with our White Rose partners, but that was almost two years ago. So we're trying to update our knowledge a little bit with the current survey. And then thinking about an institutional record in the same way that institutions keep a close eye on research outputs via CRIS, like um, Symplectic, we're beginning to discuss how we record published teaching outputs and whether our CRIS should and could undertake this role. And then finally, staffing and support, we have no dedicated OER staff. And we're trying to move towards a model where the relevant subject librarian supports individual OER projects with support from our relevant um, colleagues like copyright people, metadata people. And then at institutional level, we're really reliant on the OER working group to do a lot of the heavy lifting. I think in the longer term, um, we'd benefit from an OER administrator to manage press books and keep track of the ongoing projects, but we don't have that in place at the moment. So before I hand over to Joe and Sam, these are some of the links um, to the resources that I've referred to during the presentation. Um, but at this point, I am going to hand over. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, you've actually handed over to Anne um, to, to start with, and um, I'm just going to be 
um, introducing um, our, our project and how we how we got to the point where we are. Um, so um, of the team who are involved and who you'll be hearing from today, um, you've already heard from David. Uh, my name's Anne Hutchinson. I'm the head of library academic services at Brunel. Um, so I look after um, the academic liaison librarians and the digital skills. Um, Sam and Joe are also um, involved in this project, part of the, the working group. Um, and you'll be hearing from them in a moment. Um, and one of the reasons why Sam and Joe are involved um, with with this project at this stage is that both of them are supporting subject areas um, where for various reasons um, that we have programs which are making extensive use of um, educational resources which are already available open access. So um, OK, just a, a, an overview of what we're going to be doing just now. So what are our motivations um, for exploring um, OER at this at this point? Um, I'm not going to go into the um, the uh, uh, into a lot of detail about the drivers or the philosophy behind why we're doing this right now. Um, but in part, um, it does suffice to say that that EDI is is very high on on the agenda for why we're we're looking at this. So we're also going to be looking at the these actions that we've been taking um, and how we've been developing approaches um, to inform and engage our academic colleagues. So um, the initial work that we, well we started doing some initial work on um, open textbooks. OER, um, particularly open access um, journal articles about five years ago. And there was lots of interest at that point from the university senior management. Um, we talked with Unpaywall. We looked at um, other sources. Um, the OEN itself was not on our radar at that point. Um, and we were also finding, um, irrespective of that, that um, open textbook um, or generally ebook availability was was limited and um, some of the stuff that was available wasn't suitable. Um, OA journal articles, on the other hand, um, are now integrated into our reading list workflow. So we're always looking for an OA option there. Um, in 2021, 22% um, of total journal articles on reading lists were OA were OA, but a much higher proportion of, of these per high percentage um, were of newly added um, uh, of newly added journal articles were were OA. Um, so that for um, between um, that time and now we'd let things carry on pretty much in the same way. Um, but with the appointment of David um, as university librarian in 2022, um, with his experience um, with OEN and open textbooks. And that's brought us again um, right to the top of the agenda for us. So as I said, we've um, formed a working party. Um, that's myself, David, and Joe and Sam. As I said, um, academic liaison librarians with programs within their subject areas that are already making extensive use of OA materials beyond journal articles. Um, and also um, this collaboration with um, with colleagues at the University of Sheffield. Um, and joining the Open Education Network. It was particularly important to us to explore what other work was going on on open textbooks here in the UK. Um, nobody wants to reinvent the wheel. Um, so although their remit is rather different, we've been talking amongst other people with ebook SOS, um, and we are particularly interested in the current JISC project, Open Book Futures, um, and we're going to be talking with them a little bit more extensively. Um, we have been looking at their work as well, um, but we're very happy that what we're doing here um, is complementary 
to their existing projects. And we're also looking um, to international colleagues um, in the States and also in Australia um, and finding out what, what they've been doing. And at this point now, I'm going to hand over to Joe and Sam um, for um, a bit more detail about how we developed our workshop. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I think I'll take it from here. Uh, so I'm Sam Piker, uh, so one of the academic liaison librarians, uh, and I work with a group of mainly uh, STEM subjects, uh, which include uh, several TNE, uh, transnational education programs. So um, when we uh, set about um, developing our pilot workshop, um, we we really used that um, OER uh, toolkit, and so we had a we had a good look at the material on there and the slide deck, and um, looked at all the different approaches that have been taken in in using that. And um, we we really looked at how we could adapt it uh, not just to a UK concept uh, context. Um, but also uh, thinking about how it fitted in with the um, with the Brunel um, organizational strategy that's just been developed, uh, and all the and all the different um, all the different challenges and opportunities um, that we're we're dealing with um, as a as an institution. Um, so once we'd once we'd done a lot, once we'd done all that work, and we put um, we put our own um, our own content together. We had a group of um, of academics, a small group who had agreed to um, review the content before we before we went ahead and ran the uh, the workshop pilot. Um, and they gave us some really useful feedback, um, just giving their thoughts. Certain areas that um, that could be uh, could be maybe be developed or explained or expanded on further. Um, so then um, we decided to work with the academic practice and development unit. So the um, the, the team at Brunel that um, run all the all the different kind of uh, CPD and teaching qualification programs, and they help to uh, advertise the workshop uh, to their um, to their network, and um, we were able to get uh, get a get a fairly good group of academics together. Uh, so I think I'm going to hand over to Joanne now. Um, who can talk about how, how all that's gone and uh, progress so far. Okay, um, so I guess the one of the things just to mention is just around the aims of our workshops. So um, one of the key aims of the workshops that we plan to um, introduce um, was raising awareness of open textbooks as an open education. So that was one of the major things that we were interested in exploring. Um, but we also wanted to make visible the open education network and our new membership of it so that academics could be aware of the work that we are doing. Um, as Sam was mentioning, we've tailored the workshops to the context at Brunel, so we really wanted to reflect current challenges that academics were facing, but also learn more about them um, from the discussion within the workshops. Um, one of our key aims was also to look at um, open textbook adoption as one of many approaches. We, at the previous work we have done on introducing open textbooks, um, raise a lot of concerns from academics about the availability, quality, appropriateness of open textbooks. Um, these are some of the things we're trying to address from within the workshops, um, but also introducing opportunities um, for these textbooks in terms of their practice, how they can 
um, demonstrate their engagement with EDI issues within their teaching. And also, at this point, we are interested in promoting options to review, adapt and publish open textbooks. But we are just at a very exploratory stage right now. So this was just to make visible those opportunities with a view for um, introducing them in future. Um, so just in terms of our progress and positives in introducing the open textbooks so far, um, we were very pleased with our initial level engagement with the pilot workshops um, after only a very brief period of res registration and not a lot of marketing. We had 10 attendees um, with almost double that number expressing in interest and the attendees came from across our three colleges and were at various points in their academic careers. So we have we feel we have some good evidence that people across the university are interested in this area. Our workshop achieved its main aim of raising awareness of open textbooks. So 71% of participants who responded to our post-workshop feedback indicated that they would consider the inclusion of open textbooks in their reading materials after attending. And I would also note that although um, nobody said no, they wouldn't be interested. There were just a few maybes. Um, more than that, I think everyone in the workshops was open to and curious about open educational resources and the structure and context of the workshop works, worked well, although we have some ideas about additional activities we can potentially introduce to help us make the narrative more about the local challenges and issues, as well as some suggestions for future workshops that I'll discuss in the next slide. Um, I do want to really highlight though that one of the biggest impacts of the workshop was not in the day itself, but in the stakeholder conversations, the planning of the workshops generated. Um, as we discussed our plans with friendly academics who agreed to be consulted, that sparked additional discussions about opportunities that open education resources might bring in areas like equality, diversity and inclusion, work and teaching. And those conversations brought up different avenues for us to explore, and it felt positive and exciting to be leading the discussion in those areas. I was really energised to hear that our work was being met with an encouraging response. Um, the conversations have also meant that we are being involved in the wider discussion of larger university projects and policy where OER might have an important role to play. I also want to highlight that we have really benefited from the resources and support from the Open Education Network. So including from our UK colleagues at the University of Sheffield, it has been very helpful to be able to access the extensive resources such as the adoption workshop slide decks, but also the various recordings, readings and links available via the OEM platform. And this has contributed to us being able to develop knowledge and our teaching in this area in a much more agile way, as we are basing our work on a lot of great experience and existing practice. Um, similarly, when tailoring it to UK market, we have benefited from the pioneering work um, of the University of Sheffield and their generous sharing of their insights and approaches. Um, just move that along. Um, so following our review of the workshops, we're planning to make some small modifications to the workshop approach with the potential to include an earlier activity to gauge real academics knowledge and experience of OER. Um, we're also looking to run the workshops through other education hubs and channels. We have identified some additional workshops we can offer that are aimed at people at different levels of experience of OER. And so for more experienced academics who want to offer workshops about curating and publishing open textbooks, but we're also considering sessions for early career academics, outlining their options when it comes to reading list textbook choice. Um, we've been inspired by colleagues at Sheffield, so we have employed a student intern who will be undertaking a project um, mapping possible areas in the reading lists where open textbooks might be offered, so we can have a more research informed discussion with academics. Um, other next steps um, to help us with enabling academics to engage with opportunities to modify and adapt open textbooks as well as publish. We are progressing with a subscription to the publishing platform Pressbooks. And once we have that in place and we learn to use it ourselves, um, we are very excited about the possibilities for tailoring open textbook textbooks to meet the need of our student populations. Um, finally, um, David in particular is using um, this early work to initiate discussions about OER at a wider university level. So I'm going to hand over to him to discuss this in more depth. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, I am aware we've got 10 minutes left. 
So I will be um, really brief on this, just to say that as Joe was describing her experience with senior lecturers, as they, they were planning the workshops, um, and it was really positive. So our Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for Quality Assurance, she's leading one of the strategic strands um, around access and participation. And she was basically, she really wanted to be involved in any of the conversations that we were having on campus because she really wants to include this work in her strategic planning. Um, when I was talking to our Pro Vice Chancellor for Education, again, you, you can often tell when you're having conversations with senior leaders, the parts that they're really excited about and the parts where they're thinking, I can't spare the time for this. Um, for this, she was really open about she, what can she do to help us to communicate this more widely on campus. So we've agreed in January, she's going to really support us in a wider communication rollout and how we can get um, engagement across the whole campus and include that in her um, teaching excellence um, st strategic strand as well. Um, Joe and Sam, they've both mentioned um, sustainability, um, equity, diversity and inclusion, all of these things, um, they're so self-evident in the material that the Open Education Network is providing. I would just encourage everybody to have a look at the material that's available. Um, but one thing I would also say um, that you would have heard from Helen and you would have heard from Joe and Sam, the support we've had for the Open Education Network, there are real benefits to being members. And one of them, I think, is that we're part of that community. So we get to talk to peers in a completely different educational context in the US and um, Adrian Stagg, particularly in Australia, has been really helpful. Um, and we have been able to develop our program really quickly. Um, and so feel really confident about what it is that we're doing rather than starting from scratch. So that's been really helpful. And one last thing um, I would say as well, just when it comes to um, one of the barriers that we have is that when you look at the um, open textbook library, obviously it's very US focused. So we are expecting that a lot of academics, we think, okay, we are interested, but we need to grow those UK specific resources. And I've been having some really good conversations with Karen and with um, Dave Ernst, who's the executive director um, of the Open Education Network. Um, and they're really interested in how we can develop that local infrastructure so we can build up the number of local textbooks in the Open Textbook Library. And I'd encourage people to have a look at that as well, because what is really good about the Open Textbook Library is that it is then peer reviewed by academics. So academics who are looking at that, they can see that other um, academic colleagues can tell you the strengths and weaknesses of the material in that Open Textbook Library. So I'm in conversations with um, Dave Ernst and with Karen about what we can do to build up the, the UK network. Um, and I'm also, I'm, I think in December, we're talking at the Sconal Content Strategy Group about what we would need um, in the UK to kind of build up the network as well. So over the next, um, let's say three months, we're gonna be really thinking about what we can do to build up the network and build up the infrastructure in the UK. So I realize we have, with our enthusiasm, we have talked up until five to 12. So I'll, I'll hand back to Jane and Chris. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, hopefully you can, you can hear us. That was excellent presentation. I see that you do have your contact details here and I'm just sho shoving those in the chat. Um, can yeah, I ask a question? You. Are you specifically um, recruiting effectively for people to join up to this network? I assume that that is the case, the more the merrier. I would say absolutely yes. Um, yeah. I mean, Aaron um, can maybe talk a little bit more about that, but what I would say is that um, but what I would say is that um, even the, the fact that there's only two of us right now, we have really benefited in the UK just from, from being part of the network. And I remember when all those years ago, when Karen and I were working together um, at California Polytechnic State University, when Cal Poly joined, there were only five universities in the network. That was before um, Karen joined the OEN. So one thing I'd encourage people to think about is it sounds really small right now, but in the last 10 years, it's grown from those five universities to now that 1700 campuses. And I would really encourage people to think about what we can do in the UK to, to replicate that. Yeah, I would, I would been very like, slow, haven't we, I think, we, to adopt we have been. textbooks. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if we can do a straw poll. Can those who are uh, on the session say if they are interested in joining the OEN, it would be good to see how many people have heard what you've had to say. I, I and, can put a poll up if you want, Chris. Oh, you can put a poll up. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Well, if you put a poll yeah. up, um, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, perhaps, yeah, perhaps you can talk. Uh, I mean, it, it, what's the process of becoming a member, expressing an interest? How does that work? 
Sure. Well, um, you can email me and I'd be happy to connect you to Barb Thies, who is our Director of Community Engagement and can talk with you about the details of what's involved in join, joining the OEN. You can also go through our website and drop us a note that way. Um, there are uh, uh, community fees so that you contribute to the health and sustainability of the community. And when you join, um, Barb will take you through an orientation, introduce you to all of the resources, introduce you to the Google group, and then annually we have a get together um, where you can network and learn from um, other people in the OEN about what they're doing. Great. That's, I, I think this, that's been on my mind hearing what you're saying. It's really impressive to see. Um, what Sheffield and Brunel have done. I guess for those of us who are in a situation where we're interested in open education, but it's not our job, you know, we don't mm -hmm. we, we don't have that specific role. And what what are the prerequisites for really actually being able to to give the time and attention to this? Clearly, in Brunel's case, David, if you're you're heading the library and it's your you know a, an interest of yours, having someone in in the leadership position who really is behind it is an important one. But are there any tips you can give us for those who want to explore it but aren't sure how much bandwidth they have or how much appetite there is in their institution? Yeah, Chris, you've really landed on a on a key question that many people ask themselves across the network: is how do I find more time and energy to do these things, even though? Um, I want to do them, I might be really stretched thin. So I think that's one of the really um, valuable ways that our community can support one another. Um, there are a lot of community created resources out there where you can sort of orient yourself to OER. Some of the common challenges that you heard from Helen and Joe in terms of um, questions about, uh, you know, are these resources right for me? Um, how do I develop a publishing program? Do I want to develop a publishing program? Um, those things kind of take time to uncover and it can be much more challenging, obviously, if you don't have support from leadership. Um, and so we help people define the programs that work for their capabilities so that they're not trying to emulate programs in a context that maybe is very much unlike where they are. Right. Okay. Thank you. I see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah Helen's got a hand up. Um, I just wanted to add to that and say, don't wait until you get buy-in from senior leadership or from the university more widely, because you could be waiting for a long time. And just start whatever whatever role you're in. If you've got um, an interest in OER, start talking to people, make those connections across the university, and you will generate some interest but don't wait until you've got an OER policy or <laughs> strategic buy-in because you could be waiting a long time. Whoever's yeah. interested. Good. I think that's really good advice, Helen, started. actually. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's re relevant to Paula's question. It, uh, can individuals sign up even if their institution hasn't formally given it backing? Membership is for institutions. Um, so right. individual people can't join the OEN, right. but there are other listservs and communities um, that I can drop in the chat. Okay, All great. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And also, can I just add one, one other point to that, which is that I don't think it, the seniority is that important because what we have been offering, so when Joe and Sam were talking to lecturers, they could see the opportunity immediately. And it wasn't about seniority, it's that we are the um, open education resources work that we're doing kind of provides solutions to the things they're thinking about. So I know at Sheffield, when it comes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, that their conversations feed straight into that and they do in our strategic planning as well at Brunel. So when people are looking, how can we, we have UN Sustainable Development Goals as part of our strategic plan, how can we improve our impact there? Then this, this is a solution and people are interested in it and they actually want to talk to us. It's not as if we're having to push this on people. They hear about it and they're interested to hear more. So it's not about seniority at all, I don't think. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are now at time. Thank you so much for, for your coming along. So I've got the, we've got the polls. We have seven people that are interested, that said they are, 14 who said they're not sure yet. Um, but I think that, you know, you've gone a long way to um, helping us uh, understand what the network can do. I'm certainly very interested in this. So yeah, thanks again for taking the time to come and talk to us. Yeah, um, it's absolutely. Been a, it's been a really great presentation.
yeah this is it's re really interesting and it's it's i think it's a really good point as well that waiting for policies is never a good idea and <laughs> we all know policies take forever to update so yeah yeah lead the way with you know practice and talking to people so we've just got a couple of quick things um to run through um before we leave you as it is uh, now midday um so our next webinar will be the 8th of December, where we're running what we're calling the Big Fat Copyright Quiz of the Year with Matt Hoyts, who's joining us. Um, he's the IFLA Copyright News person. Um, but we've got a couple of um, topics that we're hoping to talk about in the new year, and we'll add to that as well. Hopefully, we'll, we'll see if we can twist Tim's arm to come and talk to us about copyright heights as well and how we put that together. Um, we just have one last thing, I think, to leave you with. Yep, and, uh, yep. me too. Chris, so you can this tell us. yeah, so uh, uh, this is a podcast that we were made aware of through uh, Maria, who is a regular um, at the uh, webinars, whose husband is a best-selling um, uh, author of historical fiction, and along with um, his pal Stephen Mackay, uh, they run this podcast. So uh, this is a this is a great podcast if you're into historical fiction and writing. Um, and if you tune in, there will be a future episode featuring a couple of copyright, self-confessed co copyright geeks. Um, <laughs> I so, imagine who uh, that is. <laughs> who, who might that be? Uh, talking yeah. about copyrights and AI. Uh, so we just thought we'd let you and know. And lots of that, other things. That that was in the pipeline, but also if you're interested in a, in a great podcast um, about historical fiction, uh, that's one to check out. Um, so Absolutely. thank you again, everyone, for your time, and we thank will see you. you on the 8th of December. Yeah, have a good weekend, everyone.